So, I'm feeling a little bit better today, and I thought I would discuss something I keep meaning to explain my uh, understanding and hot takes on in depth, um, which is quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, I don't have the level of materials prepared I would like. Uh, I want to sort of put together some slides, uh, not PowerPoint slides. I prefer to sort of write things down uh, on paper <laughs> like this uh, and just sort of show them that way. But I see a lot of confusion out there and you know, I'll right off the bat ruin it and say two things, which is if you want to understand quantum mechanics, you know, as much as there are attempts to explain it in words, and as much as there are attempts to explain it in pop science, it's probably one of the worst things to try to explain uh, in terms of science communication. Um, and then here I go at trying to anyways. Um, you know, there's basically two things you need to really need to understand if you want to understand it. Um, one is you need to actually understand the mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics, or let me just phrase that, three things. One, you need to understand the mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics. Two, you need to understand the experiments that quantum mechanics was invented to explain. Uh, and three, uh, you need to understand classical mechanics. And I would actually go through them in reverse of the order I just stated them in, which is to say, um, you know, first you should try to understand what we call classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics or all the physics before quantum mechanics was invented in uh, the early 20th century. Uh, and then you should try to understand the experiments where classical mechanics fails. And then uh, you try to learn the mathematical formalism uh, that's introduced to explain those experimental results. And then you can sort of understand it. And then you're back to the famous Richard Feynman quote, I think I can confidently say nobody understands quantum mechanics, or another one is if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Um, you know, but I'm just going to explain focusing on that second one, um, right, which is basically, it's often described in terms of reality being this sort of like smeared out fuzzy thing, um, you know, which is a somewhat accurate description. Um, but on some level, it's actually the other way around, right? The thing that people generally state quantum mechanics as when they state it correctly is uh, it is a theory of wave particle duality, right? It is a statement of how to understand the way that nature behaves in terms of both uh, particles, which have a definite uh, existence, and waves that have a uh, sort of smeared out probabilistic existence. But in some ways, it's it's actually the other way around, right? It's like, it's a theory of particles and waves, but in some way, actually, waves are the sort of thing that makes sense, and it's particles that are weird. And remember, quantum mechanics was invented around the time of the discovery of elementary particles. And that happened shortly after the confirmation of the existence of atoms. And so people wanted to explain the existence and structure of the atom and they explained it then in terms of these things they discovered called, well, primarily they discovered that the, first they discovered that uh, the Rutherford model was true, that there was, you know, uh, this chunk of positive charge surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Uh, and then they discovered around the same time that electrons are in fact these little particles, right? Um, but if you think about it, particles are actually kind of the weird thing, right? And they're inspired by the same idea as the atom, uh, right? which is that there is a point in nature where things become indivisible, right? Where you cannot break it down into further subcomponents. And it turns out atoms are not where that stops. It's at more fundamental particles like electrons. Uh, but electrons are fundamental particles. You cannot uh, turn an electron into two smaller pieces of an electron. Uh, and there's nothing that makes up an electron other than the electron itself. And that's actually kind of the weird thing if you think about it, right? We're, we're used to objects uh, like this, right? Where this is an object, uh, it's a jar of peanut butter, right? But I can, I can scoop out as much of it, you know, as much or as little of it as I want at a time. Uh, and I do, it's delicious. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's more sort of the thing we're used to, right? It's like, you know, like answer me this, have you ever seen a particle? No, you've seen waves probably. If you go out, you know, see the ocean, like, oh, there's some waves. 
but you've never seen a particle, have you? Um, you might see the effects of particles in some sense, right? You see photons hitting your eye, but you can't actually see single photons with your eye. Even the best human eyes need on the order of two or three photons uh, before you can sort of detect there being any light whatsoever. Uh, or it's actually remarkable how close some human eyes are to being single photon detectors, but they're not quite. Uh, they've never successfully gotten uh, human, no matter how good their night vision is, uh, to see single photons. And so that's really the weird thing, right? Um, and in turn, that's also couched in terms of, you know, quantum mechanics insofar as if you've heard of things like the Schrodinger equation and the evolution of like the probability distribution in terms of the evolution of the wave function, um, that's all honky dory, right? Even when you consider this weird thing about having complex numbers and you know all that stuff, it's it's not that unusual, right? We we know how to deal with waves, and it's it's a deterministic differential equation. Uh, there is no randomness whatsoever in the Schrödinger equation, uh, and in turn, it actually wouldn't be that weird either if all there was was randomness, right? We actually know how to deal with randomness very well. Um, you know, we know how to deal with what we call stochastic processes. Um, you know, like Einstein actually uh, sort of solved this problem in terms of, you know, this, this thing called a random walk. And what you end up with is, is basically the diffusion equation. You end up with like, you know, if you start with a bunch of stuff all concentrated, it will tend to diffuse out and uh, all by just sort of moving around randomly. So we know how to deal with randomness too. The problem with quantum mechanics, again, it goes back to the exact same thing when people phrase it correctly, which is that it's wave-particle duality. It's that sometimes things evolve deterministically according to the Schrodinger equation, and other times they evolve randomly according to projective measurements. And it's like the universe can't make up its mind. It's, it's you know, it, it, it would be too easy, wouldn't it, if it were one or the other. No, no, it has to be both. And when it's one versus the other is something that we have been debating about for, for quite some time. Um, there are some answers. It sometimes actually has to do with temperature, uh, right? So systems that are very hot have lots and lots of interparticle interactions because we say they're, they're basically because there's degrees of freedom that are thawed uh, versus frozen, which basically means there's enough energy for certain types of interactions to happen versus when things are very cold, um, things are, you know, there's not enough energy. There's not as much uh, randomness and things tend to evolve uh, coherently. Uh, and one interpretation is sort of the, the ultimate no drama interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is to say that there is no, there is no observation, there is only decoherence. Um, that is a very attractive interpretation with some problems, but they all have problems. Um, that one probably has a bit more than average, uh, but it's an approach I used to and still kind of do like. Um, so another interpretation is something that has gained a lot of traction, uh, which I want to address, which is, uh, you know, this many worlds interpretation. And the people will sometimes refer to it as it's as parallel universes. Um, and there, there, I think there's a big misconception about that one in particular, where people seem to imagine a parallel universe as being like displaced in space, the way another planet or another continent uh, or even another solar system or a galaxy is where there's some other place out there in space that you could travel to where it's a copy of our universe, but slightly different. And that is not how it works at all, right? The displacement between our universe and other parallel universes is in a degree of freedom completely different from time and space. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's almost like there's sort of a ghosty copy uh, of the universe that exists in the same location. So, you know, the parallel version of you is in the exact same spot as you, at least initially. Um, and, you know, but it's also not like, you know, ghosty in the sense of like, it might interact sometimes, like you will never see the parallel universe again um, once, once it happens. And the other thing people seem to not get is they seem to think that it only happens like when some sort of conscious action happens. And that's not true at all. It basically happens like literally any time two air molecules, you know, collide uh, or any time anything happens at all that would evolve according to a projective measurement. Um, which is all the time. So there's, you know, it's not like there's, you know, a bunch of different copies that are all for, it's like, there's, there's not just, there was not just infinitely many parallel universes. There is essentially infinitely many forming every single instant in time. Uh, and that is actually not in and of itself a problem mathematically. Um, it just does start to get a little bit absurd. Um, 
there's a sense in which it's still the simplest interpretation of quantum mechanics, but it's I just don't like it. Um, there are occasions where we actually in physics have not taken our calculations literally enough. Uh, and it turns out, you know, like famously with black holes, right? Einstein said, oh, in principle, you know, this means that, you know, there would be this gra process of gravitational collapse, but surely there would be some process in nature that would prevent that. And then uh, lo and behold, now we've even seen pictures of black holes. They're like, no, that just actually happens. Um, so it could be like that. Um, it's not quite like that, though. Um, there's some more problematic aspects of it. Um, and also bear in mind that like several other of these, it doesn't seem like there's actually any way of um, discerning it. Um, but the real fundamental problem with many worlds is that it still doesn't actually solve the measurement problem, right? Because now you're just stuck with this question of like, well, why, you know, so you say, okay, when there's a projective measurement, actually the system just goes into a superposition and now, you know, you are one of the superpositions and the other part of your, you are one part of the superposition state and the other part still exists and it just, you know, uh, evolves on its own independently now. Um, that's problematic because you're still stuck with the same thing, right? You're still stuck with this, like, when is the system coherent versus incoherent? Then you can still shuffle that thing in there about, like, decoherence just happens under certain circumstances depending on the statistics of the system. It's still kind of, like, leaves you with the same problem, though. Um, another interpretation that I have clung to in the past is called the Bayesian interpretation. Um, I read a paper recently, which was actually all the way back from 2012, so maybe we want to talk about this, that unfortunately was the death in many ways of the Bayesian interpretation. Bayesian interpretation basically says that the wave function does not represent the physical state of the system. Uh, all it has to do with is our knowledge and understanding of what's going on. And so it's when you as an observer observe the system, you internalize it as the wave function. And then to calculate your expectations about the system, you use the wave function. Um, the paper basically says uh, that doesn't make sense because there are some circumstances under which the wave function actually uniquely corresponds to the state of the system. Um, there's some problems with that argument, but it by and large does seem to be the death of the Bayesian interpretation. Um, so then there's another interpretation that I used to hate, but now kind of put some merit in, um, which is the sort of pilot wave theory. Um, which is, it, it, it's what they call a non-local pilot wave. So that's why it's, this is sort of basically what Einstein favored, which is, it's basically a hidden variable theory. Um, the caveat is that it has to be a non-local hidden variable theory, which basically means that the hidden variables have the ability to communicate information faster than the speed of light, whilst that simultaneously does not happen in um, observable variables. Um, and that's why it's, also kind of unsatisfying is because there's this arbitrary division of the universe into this one part where there's super luminal signals and this other part where there isn't. Um, and it has to be very, very carefully uh, divvied up into those. But I actually kind of like that interpretation now, but I don't like the meta, or not meta, I don't like the sort of subdivided interpretation of calling it a pilot wave theory. Um, I would actually express it another way. Um, where you basically just have communication between entangled particles via uh, sort of an orthogonal degree of freedom to the rest of the universe. Um, that also is problematic, though, for other reasons. Um, and then there's the two other interpretations. There is what they call super determinism, uh, which basically just means that you just say that, well, you know, uh, the universe is just so completely, perfectly planned that your decision of how you're going to set the uh, settings on your detector and also the exact nature of the interactions between all particles is pre-specified exactly so that uh, even when you think it's a random process actually the randomness was perfectly organized so that um, you know the outcome would appear um, consistent with this sort of mixed stochastic and deterministic processes that's also possible I actually put more weight in that <laughs> than I used to um, still not very satisfying. Uh, and then the final interpretation is the original interpretation, which is the Copenhagen interpretation, which I also uh, don't like, um, which is just that there are these things called conscious observers, and we um, 
force the universe from its deterministic state into its stochastic state. There you go. Born interpretation done. Um, because the, uh, the, the person who originally uh, decided that uh, maybe the wave function could be interpreted in terms of uh, the square of the wave function or the modulus squared of the wave function, the absolute value squared, uh, can be interpreted as the probability density. Uh, that was a guy called Max Born. So it's the Born interpretation, uh, which that is just true. Uh, but then there's on top of that the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that yes, and the thing that makes it a probability distribution is an actual conscious observer. That's also unsatisfying. So my final conclusion is all of these are unsatisfying. Um, and most of them, there's not a way of actually discerning them. Sometimes there is. Um, local hidden variable theories were disproved by um, something called Bell's theorem and some subsequent experimental results, but uh, not hidden variable theories in general, only uh, local hidden variable theories. And the Bayesian interpretation seems to have been uh, removed as a possibility uh, by, by this 2012 paper. Um, but it's that paper isn't 100% solid, to be honest, but it it, it seems that way. So there's there's these different hints and clues and looking in different directions. And so like it's very frustrating when you see Deepak Chopra sort of talking about quantum mechanics as this as this thing that you know directly informs us about like this is the precise nature of the universe and aha. Uh, and to me the the thing that's really fascinating about quantum mechanics is that it it is that there is no there is no real easy answers there, right? It, the thing that makes it fantastically interesting is this sort of humility before nature, right? Where it's like, you know, we have all these theories and I love them and they're beautiful, but at the end of the day, my, my favorite quote from Shakespeare, right? There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Um, you know, nature has this fantastic ability to surprise us and to produce all these wonderful outcomes that, 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 uh, help us understand it, but at the same time, uh, you know, keep us on our toes and ensure that there's still mystery. And I don't know, it's, it's, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think there's a fantastic lesson there about just, you know, nature is more wonderful than any of our abilities to understand it. Uh, even though our ability to understand it is sometimes fascinating and elegant. And again, if you do want to learn quantum mechanics, I highly recommend it. Uh, Leonard, if you have just a little bit of a mathematical background, but not much formal physics background outside of maybe some freshman classes, uh, there's some very, very, very good lectures by Leonard Susskind um, uh, on Stanford's uh, website uh, and YouTube channel. Uh, I, I cannot recommend them enough. I think I think Leonard Susskind is a, is a fantastic lecturer. Um, that's where I originally learned um, quantum mechanics and advanced physics. Um, you know, if you don't know the math, uh, you're going to want to go and learn a, just a little bit of calculus and also linear algebra. Um, there are also fantastic uh, classes for free uh, on how to do that, um, you know, and uh, yeah. But uh, if you don't, uh, do not take as the takeaway some sort of mumbo jumbo about quantum consciousness and don't take as the takeaway some mumbo jumbo about parallel universes. Uh, take as the takeaway uh, that, you know, I don't know, like look out at the stars and, you know, look at the at the world as it is uh, and see how incredibly beautiful nature is and how much it exceeds our expectations, um, even if we do sometimes get to understand it uh, just a little bit. But uh, that understanding is worth learning too. just, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than dreamt of in our philosophy.